Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Pranav Yadav. Um, when he's not working for iHeartMedia, he's, uh, he's the CEO of NeuroInsight US. Um, he actually has a financial background. He was at Goldman Sachs. And uh, he's um, a really remarkably um, crisp and entertaining and articulate speaker. Um, he, he does a really nice job telling a story. And I think, you know, as we, as we head off into, uh, into, you know, ultimately taking a break and spending a lot of time networking with each other, um, it will be really, really great to hear the story that he has to tell um, about the work that he's done in, in, uh, in NeuroInsight. And then be sure to connect with the ARF colleagues um, after Pranav speaks about how advertising works um, Jasper, who's going to actually kind of MC this afternoon, Jasper Snyder, um, and of course, uh, Dr. Horstip and, and Manuel. Um, I want to make sure. And then um, I also want to acknowledge, I think he just stepped out, but Peter Orban, um, who I learned so much from uh, when he was at the ARF, um, who is a mobile expert, and he's here as well, and you want to be sure to um, connect with him because these are all resources that are, that are here for you. So Pranav, uh, join us on the stage, and I'm going to advance the slide one and, uh, and take it away. Thank you so much for all you've done for the ARF and for me. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I'm uh, so not used to hearing good things about myself. I'm um, usually not a very likable person. Um, I'm rather direct. I'm realistic. And uh, one of my pet peeves is uh, this optimism that people have when they don't really have a reason for it. And uh, then there's the other kind of person that I love that combine optimism with vision and ability. And they're truly able to bring about change. And Gail has been one of those people. And I didn't want to start my presentation without thanking her for all she's done as well. So thank you. Other things we, ha we heard in the presentation earlier how people communicate through brands. Two of my clients in terms of Facebook and iHeart are here, and I'm wearing blue and red. And you can see that I already got a job off earlier, so it kind of works. Um, Manuel left off with something that actually I may be able to answer during the course of this presentation. So what I'm going to go through is a problem that our clients came to us with, where they asked us, like, we don't really know how to come up with a integrated campaign across all screens because there seems to be so much variation in terms of how people consume it. So as um, someone who grew up in India and Singapore and the States, uh, where I was criticized for actually going back to the first principles for everything, because I think we, we must start ground up, I actually went back deep into what we already knew to find an answer for something that we are trying to solve for now. So. Let me take you back a few years. This was my first presentation at the ARF. It was a winning paper in 2011, where we figured out that the context in which TV advertising is placed is actually sometimes as or more important than the creative itself. Okay? So, so where you were placing your ads in terms of which TV program was affecting the effectiveness of the ad. Here is an example. So can you please play the video, please? Same ad was played in two programs with the Talking same about the match. Start playing the blame game. Yeah. And all of a sudden, Bob will nudge me. And the punches will get a little harder. And then yeah. stuff will be flying around. And the stewardess will have to come and say, you guys okay? <laughs> with us after the break on Nightline, world leaders gather for a nuclear summit in Washington. And John Key is penciled in for a chat with U.S. Vice President Joe Biden. And why has Avatar director James Cameron trekked into the Amazon jungle? Juggling too many debts? Simplify your finances with a GE Money debt consolidation loan. It's one loan with one easy monthly repayment. What's more, we'll pay out your existing debts for you. All you have to do is call GE Money. Call now on 0800 55 22 to apply. GE Money, simplifying money matters. Okay, so what we noticed here was that we had two programs with the exact same ratings that people would pay the exact same money for if you were the, uh, the ad in there. But the engagement from the program flows into the engagement of the ad break. 
thereby affecting how that ad is perceived. So we realized that the ad was seen with the lens of the context and the context in this case was purely given we only had one platform back then was purely with the program that they were seeing it within. So that allowed us to come up with the theory of neurostates and what we were able to notice was that whenever you're consuming any kind of media your brain is either processing the details within the media or it's processing more of the emotional features such as themes, storylines, music, etc. And given the balance or the disbalance between how you're consuming each media, each piece of media can be given a neurostate. It can either be in terms of say a program uh, of Homeland which is giving you a lot of detail about Carrie Math Matheson's exploits. It's a lot of detail so you're processing more the details in that piece of media. Or if you're seeing Desperate Housewives, uh, and seeing all the drama that's going on, you're focusing on more of the global features of the program. And so that seems to have a global bias. So what we realized was when we actually take an ad that has a similar neurostate bias as the program and air that ad in the program, you get on, on average a 25% lift in the effectiveness of an ad. Does that make sense? It's like you're sitting, all of you are sitting here trying to you know, gather something from uh, this place trying to take that information back into your jobs and process it and use it for, for good use. You're getting a lot of detail, right? But if you're on a beach uh, sipping your margaritas or pina coladas and I were to come to you, hey, let me tell you how the brain works. You'll be like, get lost, right? And so context itself, if aligned with the messaging, you actually see a lift. So, uh, you know, this is again work from back in the day where we were able to show the correlation, 80% correlation between the program engagement and the ad rating engagement, and a 25% lift when we actually saw the neurostate of the ad match the program. Okay? So, what we used to do for our clients back then is on the right is all the neurostates of, of the programs that we had, starting from Desperate Housewives, which is a more, more globally processing bias, to uh, the Good Wife, which was a detailed bias. And depending on every ad that came our way, we tested the ad and we should make a recommendation in terms of a group of shows that would be most relevant for that ad. Okay? But today, things have changed. We have moved beyond TV and luckily, thanks to the other presenters, I don't have to go through all of this information about media fragmentation and how much time we spend on each screen. We know that people are spending a lot of time in, on these screens. So the context that we were talking about earlier, which was only TV and TV programming, has changed to the screen as well. So we're looking from the filter off the screen to the context, then to the ad. So how does this, this screen matter? Are all screens equal? There's the same content seen across different screens, the, uh, consumed the same way. So this is an example I just threw horse uh, picture in there just because I wanted to play with him a little bit. So we actually tested the same content across multiple screens, okay? And we have hours and hours of data across 500 respondents. And we wanted to see how people were consuming the same media across different screens. And what we were able to figure out was the same neurostate theory that held true for the programming context, held true for the screens. And each screen had an inherent neuro, uh, neurostate bias and it depending on the, depending on the kind of screen it was, its size, um, th the kind of things people were using it for. So if you were to look at, say for example, mobile phones, which is a much more personal device, um, and you use a lot more personal things on it, it has a more emotional or globally biased neurostate. And if you were to see TV, where you were see, you know, you've been trained to consume things a certain way, it had a more detailed bias. So what could we do with this information that each screen had its own neurostate bias? To, for us to be able to take the same piece of content and then make it useful across different screens, that neurostate bias for each screen came in really handy. And that helped us create these things that we call multi-screen ready rules. And the first thing that we have to do uh, in order to figure out what needs to go across each screen is identify what we call the iconic trigger. Now, if I were to ask you what was the last ad that you watched, uh, uh, or what last movie that you watched, your brain's not going to go back to the credits of the movie. Your brain's going to go back to certain moments within the movie that were well encoded in your memory, and thanks to all the other people who spoke before me, they spoke about this idea of memory encoding. 
if I am able to identify that one moment or a few moments that were encoded in your memory, the way the brain works is that it uses that as hooks to recreate the entire story. And those things we call the iconic trigger. So let's figure out how do we identify the iconic trigger. What I'm going to take you through is uh, an ad for Coke that we tested. In, in this case, you are going to see the second by second memory encoding. Okay. In the red will be the memory for details in this particular thing that you're seeing. In the blue will be the memory for global features such as themes, storylines. And anything above this 0.7 line right here is deemed to be effective in terms of whether it's going to impact your decision making or not. Can you please play the video? Okay, so if you were to look at the peak in memory encodings during this time, we would be able to figure out what the iconic triggers are. Um, this first one was the image that we ended up choosing as the iconic uh, trigger because if you were to take this first image, given most people would have gone through the first 20 seconds of the ad, not, uh, and we don't know whether they would have seen sat through the entire 60, we picked that one moment as the iconic trigger. That's the moment when the Coke drops into the CPU of the computer. Now, if you were to take this one image, and this is a previous solution that we used to apply it from like six, seven years ago, where people used to come to us and we used to identify the iconic trigger and they used to take this image and place it in their banner ads, place it outdoors, place it in like uh, any kind of digital advertising as well. So we identify this iconic trigger. The second thing we do, and this is the most important part, is identify within this piece of creative, the vignettes, that have either a more detailed bias or a more global bias, according to the neurostates that we already know. So we already know what neurostates we have for each screen, TV being more detailed and laptops and phone, phones being more globally biased. We look at the creative and figure out all the globally biased vignettes, like we have right here, and we look at all the detailed bias vignettes. And then we actually take put these together and put the third uh, criteria in where we look at figure out what timings of, of ad products do we have across each screens, what is the neurostate bias and take those individual vignettes and the third thing we do is take the, bring in the iconic trigger and place it within the first three seconds given the viewability of an ad in the, on, on, on the mobile phone is usually like three seconds to five seconds. So when we do all of this together what we're able to do is cut uh, different versions of the same campaign and customize it to each screen, thereby giving you a 360 degree solution of the same campaign that's catered specifically for that screen. So here's an example how we would have cut this ad into several different versions. Can you please play the video?
That's the iconic in the first three seconds. So when our brand clients come to us, not only will we take the creative, we optimize it, we tell them what the neurostate is, what programs would be best suited to them. We also take that creative, cut it for different screens so they can actually make it a 360 degree campaign. Um, last year, like uh, one tenth of uh, this work that we put into putting this all together uh, actually was one of the top five winning papers at the ARF as well where we actually looked at 576 respondents across uh, 280 plus hours of media content. Um, and uh, so we, once we proved that as a concept, we took it at a bigger scale and launched this product. Um, because this is complicated, I thought I'd leave five minutes in the end for Q&A. So uh, I have five minutes. Anybody has any questions? Perfect. Please. Yes. Uh, you may not even get, uh, you know, like if, a, if an ad is particularly has a certain kind of bias in a certain kind of way, you have to come up with different creative options to be able to optimize it. So, so this is not uh, like a, a solution that works for every single thing. It is better than the current solution that people have. Uh, but yes, there are certainly ads that are unoptimizable. Please. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that we, you know, find that's key across all of these, like skippability and autoplaying, is that presence of uh, a moment within the first few seconds that may actually hook them into the rest. And that's how we optimize things within mobile, uh, is find that iconic trigger and place it within the first three seconds. And actually, we see um, that viewability actually stays it goes up by a few hundred percent once you actually throw in that iconic trigger uh, within the first three seconds. So we do that work as well. Hundred percent. Uh, Radha here is prime example. In one of the studies that we did, we actually tested uh, a, a, the same trailer on TV with like actual. Um, uh, actual actors and they're like a proper movie trailer and we, then we had the audio of that trailer um, and I think uh, I forget the movie but it's with all the old guys Tyler what is it Expendables, expendables. Um, so so the idea of expendables when you actually listen to the sound sounds actually pretty good right and when you actually see these haggard uh, uh, old men trying to be young again uh, it wasn't very appealing visually on as a movie trailer in itself so, so there was actually a 40% difference in effectiveness uh, of the trailer, the same trailer on TV and just the audio. So there's a, there's a whole difference and the brain kind of consumes media as a whole. It doesn't divide audio and video like we do. But when consumed, when the audio is all of its consumption, it, it, it will imagine like it'll make up what visual, whatever it wants to imagine and will consume it in a certain way versus actually being given the visual, which is not very appealing. Um, to be honest, I'd be lying if, if I were to say that we've actually done work to prove that point um, because the work that we've done has been across consumption for a particular group of people on a platform or with a certain kind of program. Uh, I, I'd be, you know, I, I'd be making things up and I don't do that, so I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Please. Hundred percent. 
100%. Uh, and we've done actually, we've done some work together because the iconic trigger may just be because of the sound as well. So, so, so given, given the usage, uh, we identify the iconic trigger accordingly. So the test is, is designed to actually identify it with or without sound. Hundred percent. So, one of the things that we've done with, with one of our clients who actually does this on a monthly basis, they're an outdoor outdoor advertising company, and they'd actually come to us with like a group of sixty or seventy images every month, which we put together in a reel and flip through, and we identify for them which one of these are likely uh, to be become iconic triggers if they were to use them. So that's how we do that. Likely based on like whether they're driving memory encoding or not. Uh, whether they seem engaging in terms of personally relevant or they have any kind of emotional measure, measures associated with it. Well, Sorry, I can't see. Yes, sir. Yeah, you want to just uh, talk to the audience a little bit about the creative, where the iconic trigger and the branding moment are not always in the same place. That's true. So, so the hook, uh, I mean, you'd, it'll be amazing for any brand, and I have 18 seconds to say this. It'll be amazing for any brand for the branding moment to be the iconic moment. Uh, and that's more, most often not the case. So what we do in terms of like presenting the iconic trigger, in terms of outdoor settings, etc., is we take the iconic mid trigger, which is different from the branding moments, and we actually brand it for the brand, so that people actually start associating brand with that trigger, and it again creates this 360 degree. Every time they look at that image, they recreate the entire 30, 60 exp uh, seconds experience they have with the ad on TV or other platforms. And I am done. <laughs> Thank you.